بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمد الشاكرين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها ونور الأبصار وضيائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد كلما ذكرك الذاكرون وغفل عن ذكرك الغافلون Today the discussion was intended to revolve around the president of France and the recent publication of the Charlie Hebdo cartoons insulting cartoons as well as the political reaction and the sad news of the passing away of Alama Khadim Rizwi rahimahullah ta'ala and the historical background of the clash between liberal extremism and religious fundamentalism in Pakistan especially so this entire discussion the inception of the discussion is from what is termed islamization uh, as well as modernity and reform movements or reformist movements the clash between these three narratives within muslim majority countries but with exclusive uh, concentration on the country of pakistan how do we understand the the political context of today's current climate in Pakistan and Turkey with the backdrop of the events that have occurred not only in the past few weeks but in the past decade and in the previous years there is an obvious clash between three segments of the muslim community in Pakistan Pakistan is a confused nation because you have traditionalists clashing with reformists and then you have a third segment of outright secularists or uh, liberalists who we would say extreme liberalists clashing with the clerics and the clerics within themselves you have various uh, spectrums of clerics with different interpretations this is the the current backdrop that we are witnessing in the 1980s in pakistan under the late general zia ul haq there was an attempt and the term used is islamize pakistan but in reality pakistan from its inception has had many different currents of interpretation they have there are various ways of interpreting what pakistan was intended for to this day there is no real consensus uh, the many of the admirers of the late muhammad ali jinnah they state that the purpose of pakistan was to uh, establish a country for muslims but with a secular uh, secular basis for that country while others have said that the purpose of pakistan was to establish a state a country nation states which were a product of the post colonial period that the purpose of pakistan was to establish a country governed by islamic law islamic sharia with this intention the constitution was formulated after the founding of pakistan in 1947 and if you read that constitution there are attempts to reconcile modernity with islam and there are many <clears throat> notable figures of uh, pakistan pa- pakistani or in indian history muslim figures that are admired by muslims who have contradictory statements when you read their works if people actually read their works they will find many contradictory statements sometimes those statements may be formulated in order to appease the ruling powers and at other times 
uh, in order to appease the Muslim masses of the Indian subcontinent. But without doubt, Pakistan is a country that should be protected. The borders should be protected, especially from the enemies of Islam, like the, the state of the illegal state of Israel and also India. From these type of countries, the borders of Pakistan must be protected. But to have a protection of the country, there is a need of a national identity which gives cohesiveness, which does not divide, which unites the population of Pakistan Muslims who form the majority of the country as well as the minority Muslim, non-Muslims in Pakistan. So this cohesive narrative is something which needs to be from <clears throat> a source which is agreed upon by the vast majority of the population, which we would say is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But in the 1980s, there were attempts to Islamize the, these various segments of Pakistani society. But there was also a clash between liberalists uh, liberal idealists, humanists, uh, people who are affected by various philosophies and outright secularists. And this happened, for instance, with women's rights. In the 1980s, the women cont women's rights organizations contested certain Islamic laws. Now, other people claimed that General Zia al Haq only appealed to Islamic sentiments in order to uh, have a populist support within the popula within the Pakistani uh, citizenship amongst the citizens to have support. He appealed to their Islamic sentiments. Whatever his motives were, he did make many reforms, removed certain <clears throat> cultural uh, interpretations of Islam which were incorrect, like in certain rural areas they have incorrect practices that are un-Islamic and which in fact if those cultural pr practices are done away with and Islam governs the rights of women in those regions the, r the rights of women are enhanced rather than being mitigated in any way or form. So in the 1980s General Zia al Haq made these reformations and appealed to the Islamic sentiments of the population one of those reforms was relating to the rights of women. And the Diya Masla came up. The Diya Masla is the blood money. So the blood money of a woman is half of that of a man. If a man is killed and blood money is given, that blood money is the value of a hundred camels, which is a high value. But the blood money of a woman is half of that of a man. So this became an issue for, for uh, women's rights activists in Pakistan. And another point of clash between segments of Pakistan, Pakistani society, and what they referred to as the Islamizing of Pakistani law was the distribution of zakat or the collection of zakat carried out by the state. There was also a clash between the state and segments of the Pakistani community. These are case examples where in Pakistani history there has been a clash between Islamic law and segments of Pakistani society. Of course, why I mentioned three groups at the beginning is because you have what some will refer to as conservative Muslims or traditionalists uh, and a second segment of Pakistani society which is referred to as the reformists, those who call for reform of Islamic law, not a doing away of Islamic law, but a reformation of the interpretation of Islamic law, how Islamic law should be uh, reinterpreted to make it compatible with modern society and modernity as they view modernity. The third segment is the liberalists and you have <clears throat> like they may say, you have extreme liberalists, uh, extremist fundamentalists uh, in religion. You have 
extremist fundamentalists in liberalism also, like the late Christopher Hitchens, he's, he has famously stated when he supported the wars abroad, he, he mentioned that there are two fronts to, uh, to opposing religion today. One is the new atheists, meaning the ideologues of um, humanist philosophy, and the second are the aeroplanes at the time, the bombers that were actually uh, leaving uh, uranium, depleted uranium in Iraq, meaning bombarding civilian populated areas with uh, depleted uranium. These were the two spearheads of new humanist ideology. So in Pakistan you have this ruling elite that have liberalist ideas and I would say they are ex in fact extremist liberalists. They are, but the, the, the difference is that they are a minority in Pakistan and therefore cannot do everything that they intend to do or carry out. They have been the main benefactor, uh, the main beneficiaries of the formation of Pakistan since the formation of Pakistan until today. This elitist group within Pakistan have been the main beneficiaries of the state, have been benefiting from the country and uh, plundering the country, the likes of Nawaz Sharif and others. So, the clash of these three groups. And then you, you may say that there is a fringe of the third group, which is an outright secularist group that do not believe in religion and will say that they are in fact cultural Muslims. What a cultural Muslim is, uh, the first time I came across a so-called cultural Muslim was at Manchester University, where a Pakistani man, a man who had been born in Pakistan, not of Pakistani origin or descent, a man who had been born in Pakistan, he became annoyed at my refutation of an atheist and he introduced himself as a cultural Muslim. This was the first time I had heard such a term. Later I became familiar that a cultural Muslim is someone who just sees Islam as a culture that they are born in, but they have no belief in Islam. This is a fourth segment of Pakistani society that is utterly opposed to the cleric, despises uh, the clerics, despises Islam, despises the Sharia, despises the Quran, and they do make a, a, an influential segment of Pakistani society. So this clash was visible in the 1980s during the time of General Ziaul Haq. Of course, the response to the first claim that the Diya law, the blood money law is unfair, the response to that would be very simple. The response is that the money that is accrued for the blood money of a man is given to his spouse. So the blood money that is taken for a man being killed who has been killed in, um, in an accident or through manslaughter, that blood money is given to his spouse. So the beneficiary of the blood money is the spouse. The one who benefits is the spouse. The female takes the money. And with the half blood money of a woman, that money is given to the husband. And this is not the value of the life of a man or woman. This is not the value of the woman as has been misconstrued. This is a misconstrued interpretation. The value of the man and woman is the same. The, the difference in the blood money is simply because the man is the guardian for the female and he must take care of the female in paying for her costs. Everything in the married life, the upkeep of the spouse is kept by the male. So because of this, the woman, she can take whatever dowry she pleases. If she takes a high dowry, that's her choice. After marriage, she does not need to spend in the marriage. She does not need to, even the money she earns, she keeps for herself. Her savings, she keeps. She has this right. Whether she exercises the right is a different issue. <clears throat> but then if the husband dies, the value of the blood money is given to the woman, which is double if she had died, and she is the beneficiary of that blood money. So the women's rights groups were in fact 
misunderstanding so many various issues of Islamic law. Another example of this, which is commonly brought up, is that two uh, the women witnesses that are required for for shahada, the two women count for one man. And this again, it is stated by feminists that is an infringement of women's rights. But this is incorrect because there are the two female witnesses accounting for one man is only in specific cases in Islamic law. There are other case specific laws in which the woman's witnessing is sufficient and the man's witnessing is discounted. So that is not cited by people who criticize Islamic Sharia law or, or, or women's rights or feminists who were active in Pakistan at that time. Likewise, the distribution of the zakat, the zakatul amwal being taxed by the state, this is the ruling in the Sunni uh, ju- uh, schools of jurisprudence. But the Shia minority in Pakistan, they disapproved of this law and protested against it. The simple solution would have been for the government at that time to apply the law to the Hanafis of the country which make up the majority of the country and to apply a different law to the Shia minority uh, because the minorities are permitted to be governed according to their own laws. But the the majority of the country, the Hanafis, would have been taxed uh, through the Zakatul Amwal which is the collection of the Zakat. Sometimes these problems which are brought up in Pakistani society because of the deep polarization between deeply religious people or what they refer to as conservative Muslims and neoliberalists or extreme liberalists or humanists in Pakistan because of the the polarization there is no communication between the two groups and there is no understanding between the two groups and if there is then the reformists tend to take that middle ground or attempt to take that middle ground but the reformist methodology is also flawed because in reality the reformist groups who reinterpret Islam to such a degree that it's not a reinterpretation in fact it's an alteration of the correct teachings of Islam <clears throat> these reformist groups go hand in hand with humanist philosophy whatever society dictates becomes the norm so in a society where democratically the society calls for gay marriages the reformists those who claim to be Muslims but understand Islam better than those who are called traditionalists or conservatives they the reformists they say that Islam, the laws of Islam need to be reinterpreted in accordance with the the norms of that society. So if homosexual marriages were deemed as normal in a democratic society, they would reinterpret the law, the verses of the Quran in order to, like the Church of England, meaning a reformationist movement, the Church of England, Henry, King Henry, uh, <coughs> decided to marry a second time initially and then opposed the Roman Catholic Church and formed the Church of England and the Church of England has its unique positions likewise the reformists they reinterpret certain uh, laws of Islam but the principles or the qawaid the legal maxims are not set in stone for them they change in accordance with what they deem as right. Meaning there, is, there are no set principles, unlike the traditionalists. The traditionalists from the time of Imam Muhammad bin Idris al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala who wrote a risala from that time in the year 150 he was born. So the book was written within the first 200 years of Islam until today have set principles of, of interpreting hermeneutics interpretation of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam while the reformists their method is more of a heuristic method a method 
of employing whatever you understand at the time. So this can change from uh, generation to generation. The, the <coughs> objection to traditional Islam, Sunni Islam, Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, is that then you become rigid, parochial in your pro- approach, and Sharia law then is not applicable in every time and place. But the response to that is that the if someone understood the Sharia law, the legal maxims, al qawaid al fiqhia and the application of legal theory, they will understand the laws which are relative to time and place do change with time and place. But the laws that are uh, etched in stone, those laws remain the same. So theft is always illegal. But there, the punishment for theft, like the amputation of the hand, is not applied if the conditions are not met. Like in the time of Sayyiduna Umar, an, there was a drought. So Sayyiduna Umar an, did not apply the punishment of amputation. This was not a reforming of the law, as is interpreted by the reformists. It was simply the application of the law, uh, the conditions were not met. If Sharia law is applied in the way it actually is correctly and understood correctly, you will realize that the Sharia law is not as rigid as it's made out to be by um, people who misunderstand much of it, whether claiming to be religious or those who are liberals, meaning the, the two extremes that clash at times. Some of them do not even know the correct interpretation of the actual uh, application of Sharia law and the rigidity, uh, the application of the rigidity or whether there is any rigidity at all and many of them have a totalitarian interpretation of Sharia law. So the, the obvious clash between reformists and uh, traditionalists is something which also exists. Some of them refer to them as bourgeois, meaning people who are the bourgeois, the intellectuals of uh, society. But I would say these two extremes can be summarized <coughs> in an anecdote. Uh, what they mention regarding, um, uh, some ascribe this to the late Allama Iqbal, rahimallahu ta'ala, that he mentions that some people came from Siberia to visit a scholar from the Indian subcontinent, and they said that we intend to adopt Islam as a a teaching and a religion. And however, the area in Siberia is covered with snow and we cannot perform wudu, ablution, because it is too cold. Do you have any dispensation? The the famous uh, term used by uh, liberal extremists is mullah. The mullah said, meaning this is something, a way of insulting, In the, the intent is to insult. But the conservative mullah said, no, there is no leeway, and therefore they decided not to adopt Islam. Of course, he could have given them the leeway of tayammum, dry ablution, saying that there is a difficulty in performing ablution, that there is fear of harm of the cold ice, and therefore tayammum, dry ablution is permitted, but he did not give them this leeway. What this anecdote is demonstrating is that there is sufficient leeway in Sharia law, sufficient leeway, that Islam is applicable, the laws of Islam are applicable in every time and place. But at the same time, you have absurd reformist verdicts which fly in the face of common sense. So uh, reformist verdicts that fly with common sense are verdicts which are given... uh, uh, in the in the modern age, which the traditionalists then refute, so this is the the clash that occurs between traditionalists or conservatives, and you have uh, tra- uh, reformists. But the the correct way is what we would refer to as the traditionalist understanding of Islam, is that in Islam there is sufficient leeway within the four Sunni schools, and sufficient leeway in the interpretation of Sharia, that the set rules of Sharia are never changed. So alcohol is prohibited at all times for Muslims. So again, the the conservative who is unfamiliar of Islamic law would think that law applies to non-Muslims. And the 
the liberal extremist or the reformists would think that the traditionalists are calling for banning of alcohol for the minorities in Muslim countries when this is incorrect. The correct understanding of Sharia is that the alcohol is prohibited in public places for Muslims. But the laws that apply to non-Muslims are different, meaning Sharia law mainly affects Muslims as opposed to minorities. So these are various considerations to be given that within Pakistan and Turkey and, and Turkey, you have clashes between segments of, uh, commu- of, of those communities that you have uh, conservatives, ultra conservatives, you have traditionalists, you have uh, neoliberals, you have humanists, you have secularists, all of these groups clashing. But at the same time, the sole difference between Pakistan and other countries is that Islam, uh, the country of Pakistan, ostensibly was made in the name of Islam. This is what makes it different and unique. So, At this juncture, we turn to what is referred to as underdevelopment. Underdevelopment is that in Pakistani society, there is a a concern regarding the underdevelopment of Pakistan. That Pakistan has not developed, or Muslim communities have not developed as they should have. And there is always a comparison between Muslim-majority countries and the West, meaning which one of these two has... uh, which uh, of the two, the West or the the Muslim majority countries have developed enough in terms of technology and modernity and other things. There is always a cross comparison between the two. The blame is often laid at at Islam by some and by some at the clergy for the lack of development. Even though this claim is flawed, because from the inception of Pakistan, 1947 until today, the country of Pakistan has been governed for the main part by secularist people. Or if you say they are not secularist, you would say neoliberals. Um, at times, they make alliances with the clerics, like uh, the late Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, uh, Bhutto uh, General Zia. They, are, they, they make certain alliances with clerical movements, with Islamic uh, uh, movements. But as a whole, they are liberals. And the liberal elite that governed Pakistan from its inception is the same elite that has plundered Pakistan. The same group of people have plundered Pakistan. But there is a discussion regarding underdevelopment. An example of this is a famous book. Uh, This book, uh, the name of the book, Islam, Authoritarianism and Underdevelopment by Ahmed uh, T. Kuru. This is a Turkish author, and this book is famous in uh, some Pakistani bourgeois. He he utilizes the word bourgeois, uh, intellectual circles. The book, again, the criticism of the book that I have, I will go on to shortly. But interestingly enough, he has a chart within the book that gives us a list of Muslim countries. So you have here those countries which are sec- Muslim majority countries which are secular. Then you have uh, Muslim majority countries that rec- recognize Islam as the official religion. And then here you have a list of countries which have Sharia law or uh, in the gov- in the constitution of the country they have Sharia law. These are those countries. So if you notice, the majority of the Muslim countries today have secular law. They do not have Islamic law. The majority, in fact, this this list is increased now with the Sudan and Bangladesh. And also in the future, maybe UAE and Saudi Arabia. So this list is increased. The, these countries, the ones in the middle, recognize Islam as the majority religion, the official religion, but the, are not necessarily governed by Islam. These are the only countries that are, are claimed to be governed by Islam or have Islam in the constitution. So the majority of the Muslim world is in fact governed 
by secular law. So to blame Islam post-colonial period, to blame Islam for the underdevelopment of the Muslim world is absurd. Because the governments, the majority of the governments are secular. And even in the, the list that has uh, Islamic governance, so-called Islamic government, governance, you can see the list. You have Bahrain, you have Brunei, Egypt, Iran, Iraq. Kuwait, Libya, Maldives, Mauritania, Oman, Pakistan, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, Syria, Sudan. Now, Sudan is off that list now. UAE and Yemen. Now, <coughs> even those countries, we know that, for instance, in Pakistan, the majority of the rulers have been neoliberalists or people with liberal ideas, like the Bhutto family and others. So, uh, the criticism of this book, the short criticism, he, his theory for underdevelopment is that when there was a, an alliance between ulama, clerics and governments, Muslim governments, that would lead to underdevelopment of the Muslim world from the 11th century. The summary of my critique of this book, he claims prior to the 11th century there was no alliance between ulama and governments. The counterclaim is that the most successful period of the Muslim world in terms of development, material de uh, development, was during the first 300 years of Islam when there was m the most religiosity, but also there, was, there, was, there were groups of philosophers and free thinking that occurred in the Muslim world, which is true, and uh, zealot groups, you had heretics, you had all ways of thinking in the first 300 years but the most successful period there were alliances between scholars and some of the caliphs the simple example is that of Harun al-Rashid and al-Imam Abu Yusuf the codification of law of the Abbasi Caliphate occurred under Abu Yusuf rahimallahu ta'ala so the the claim that the alliance of ulama and governments is what led to the decline of development in the Muslim world is a flawed claim. In fact, in the early 1800s, in the Ottoman Caliphate, the removal of science from the curriculum did not occur by, uh, by Muslims, uh, who, who, those who, who profess Islam, uh, in, in a, as a way of governance, the removal of science from the curriculum. In, uh, under Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, science was taught in the curriculum, in the madaris, in the schools, in Islamic schools, science was taught alongside Islam. So this uh, clash that is claimed between science, uh, technology, and the belief in the metaphysical realm is simply refuted by saying that there is no clash when it comes to scientific research or that which is in the metaphysical realm. Uh, recently, there was a Pakistani politician uh, uh, within the uh, uh, political party of Imran Khan who criticized scholars uh, for the moon sighting issue. And he said that the, the moon sighting can be done through scientific means and calculation. And said that there is no clash between Islamic law and uh, uh, scientific calculations. This is a prime example of how clerics are clashing with people who have sec a secular understanding. This man, he was misunderstanding Islamic law correctly stating scientific data but misunderstanding Islamic law and therefore making that a means to uh, undermining the ulama, the scholars. How was he misunderstanding? The, the sighting of the Eid moon is based on the actual sighting by the naked human eye which can be done through the means of a telescope also. If the moon is scientifically it's born, meaning it's there, but the physical naked eye of the human eye does not see the moon, then the Eid is not done. That is the simple ruling. This ruling has nothing to do with science. But these are some of the 
misunderstandings that occur between the liberal elite of Pakistan or the ruling class of Pakistan and some of the clerics in Pakistan, in some cases who are unable to even eloquently explain such types of rulings. So this claim that there is a clash between science and Islam or the metaphysical realm, belief in the metaphysical realm is unfounded. Islam allows the development of science. The only uh, the reason for the underdevelopment now, one of the main reasons is the lack of scientific funding given by governments. Meaning governments, if they do not fund scientific research, then science will not uh, will not uh, advance in those countries. So those countries that are not funding science, they must blame themselves for the underfunding of science and scientists. There is no clash between scientists and scientific research and Islam. Those who claim that there is a clash between science and Islam, either they have not studied Islam correctly, and if they have, they have not studied science correctly. They do not understand science and how science works how paradigm shifts in scientific research work, how scientific data can be interpreted. Now, if the interpretation of scientific data clashes with Islam, then Muslims simply await a scientific revolution that reinterprets the same data in, in, a, in a manner which is more conforming or compatible with the Islamic teachings. But scientific data itself is never rejected. So the, the human finds, for instance, of various skeletons throughout the world or uh, uh, the human remains and the, the research on the DNA and the human genome, all of this data is not refuted by Islam. It's accepted. The scientific method interprets that data and that can always undergo a change and it awaits a change at all periods of time. So those who make a clash between Islam and science if they are clerics, they do not understand science. And if they are scientists, they do not understand Islam. This is why it is essential for clerics to read scientific books, uh, at least popular books on science. And likewise, for scientists who dabble in religious issues, they should at least have a good understanding of Islam uh, prior to uh, critiquing Islam, because once they understand, they will not critique. So... This clash between science, technology and metaphysics is also false. With this backdrop, we understand the issue relating to Salman Ta'asir. Salman Ta'asir, the governor of Punjab, who was killed in the year 2011, intervened in a case of blasphemy regarding a Pakistani woman, Asya Bibi, a Christian Pakistani woman. And when he intervened as a governor, and this is one of the issues that the rule of law in Pakistan. So later Salman Ta'asir would claim that the law is abused, the law is misused by people. But at the same time, you have this system of governance in Pakistan that people in power can intervene in judiciary cases. That if there is a case, in uh, the, the, ju the judiciary should make the judgment. But politicians can meddle at any time. This was occurring during that time in uh, Pakistan and still occurs. So Salman Ta'asir, and you, you have to remember Salman Ta'asir belongs to that neoliberalist segment, uh, elite segment of Pakistan. The same people who have plundered Pakistan, plundered Pakistan in the past 70 years and when uh, it suits them, all of a sudden, Salman Ta'asir has a concern for a minority. Meaning, a, these governors, in that particular case, the governor of Punjab, uh, you have the governor of Balochistan, the governor of Sindh, meaning so many human rights abuses happen in that country that are astonishing. And all of a sudden, this governor has a care for a woman, which is a good thing if you have uh, you care for a for the weak uh, minorities in any country, the Christian minorities and the Hindu minorities, the Sikh minorities. But he intervenes on a controversial case where this woman was accused of blaspheming against the Messenger of Allah. 
Now when he intervenes, he ostensibly he's intervening for the human rights of this woman. And this, uh, I remember the issue at the time, prior to him being killed, that I was suspect and regarding his motives. Because these governors and these ministers in Pakistan never intervened for justice. But now this man has a concern for a Christian woman in a Muslim majority country. Then in an interview he said that this law that the, the law that relates to blaspheming, insulting the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he states that this law is a black law. Now of course the law he's referring to is a law that was introduced prior to the formation of Pakistan, so during the colonial period, initially. And the detractors, the critics of the law, they say, look, the law was introduced by the British, therefore the law uh, must be flawed. And then the law underwent modification and amendments were made to the law in the time of General Zia. So the law he was criticizing was the law that the amendments that were made in the time of General Zia. And he said this, he said, this is a law that was made in the time of General Zia and criticized General Zia, saying Zia was a brutal dictator. He was from the People's Party, so he would be uh, a critic of General Zia because General Zia had uh, uh, Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto killed. So, meaning the law was Ill illegal in the first place. A brutal dictator made the law according to Salman Ta'seer. So therefore, terming the, the law as a black law, Kala Kanun, uh, he saw as that uh, he referred to the law as a Kala Kanun and then defended himself uh, post those comments when he was, when a, when clerics declared him a disbeliever or said he uttered words of disbelief. How he clarified, he said, I'm referring to the abuse of the law as well as saying that the law is abused and the law is not implemented correctly. As well as saying that this law is meaningless because we are a Muslim majority country, no one insults the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this country. Meaning, if we do away with the law, uh, the law has no application because no one insults the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in this country. Majority are Muslims, and the non the minorities will not insult the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That was the backdrop of prior to him being killed and gunned down by Mumtaz Qadri, who fired 17 bullets into him. That backdrop is very important to understand that here we have a clear clash in one society, in one society, Muslim society, where you have the interpretation of neoliberalists regarding Islam and how Pakistan should be, and you have the majority of the population uh, or a large segment of the population of Muslims who believe that these type of sentiments and these type of statements are denigrating and amount to disbelief. So describing the law as Kala Qanun. Now what was stated with regard to that, describing this law as a Kala Qanun, a black law, Irrelevant to who done the amendments, the law itself was done with a consultation with the, the scholars of Pakistan, the Muslim scholars, clerics of Pakistan. Even Dr. Tahirul Qadri, who is a critic of Mumtaz Qadri, a critic of Alama Khadim Hussein, Dr. Tahirul Qadri has various statements where he mentions his involvement in the amendments of that law. So he has approved of that law, meaning Dr. Tahir al-Qadri would fall under the reformist group of clerics of Pakistan, along with Dr. Jawed Ghamdi and others. Dr. Tahir al-Qadri approved of that law in the time of General Zia. That, those amendments were in accordance with Sharia law, with, in accordance with the, the Islamic law. Some critics have said these people are Hanafi, so how can they apply the Maliki law? Uh, or how can they apply the law from other madhahib? The correct uh, position is that 
the four schools are the four Sunni schools. So if a constitution of a country has Im- amendments in accordance with any one of those four schools, those laws are permitted and valid. Whether that Han- the country is majority Hanafi or Maliki or Shafi'i or Hanbali, the ruler, Wulatul uh, Amr, the rulers of that country, they have the open decision of making those laws in accordance with any one of those four Sunni schools. Meaning these are very... Uh, these are views. Uh, these statements are dismissed uh, straight away, but the statement made by Salman Taqsir in reference to the law was seen as an act of insult to a law of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala simply because those amendments were in accordance with the Sharia, irrelevant to whether they were done in the time of General Ziaul Haq. When you read the court statements of uh, Mumtaz Qadri, you will find that Mumtaz Qadri mentions the reasons for uh, shooting Salman Ta'asir. One of those reasons he mentions is that he spoke derogatory remarks in front of him and this angered him to kill <coughs> Salman Ta'asir. At that point, you have the polarization, the, the, the society in Pakistan and elsewhere, wherever you have uh, expat Pakistanis, the communities were polarized. You had people referring to Salman Ta'asir as an innocent victim who was gunned down by a terrorist. And you had people referring to Mumtaz Qadri as a terrorist. And you had people uh, praising Mumtaz Qadri and saying he did the act of uh, a hero and a person who carried out the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the, the backdrop to the events that occurred in recent times with regard to the French cartoons. So, Salman Ta'asir was the face of those people, of neoliberalists, uh, families, meaning even his son and uh, supported uh, the uh, Qadiani who spoke in front of Donald Trump, meaning his son was next to the Qadiani who spoke in front of Donald Trump. Uh, these people are the neoliberalists who want the direction of Pakistan to go in a certain direction. After this, you have Mumtaz Qadri arrested and jailed, uh, at the same time hailed by a, a hero even amongst police officers. Because as soon as he is arrested, the police officers record him reciting praise of the Prophet wasallam. They upload that on the World Wide Web and the entire world observes him singing. So, Mumtaz Qadri is then placed in jail from the year 2011. And the case of Asya Bibi, and remember there were two ministers killed. Uh, if my memory serves me correct, the other one, his, his surname was Bhatti, uh, a Christian uh, Minister of Parliament. He was also gunned down, but by unknown uh, people. The assailants, those who carried out the action, were unknown. The case of Asya Bibi is reopened. Now, when the case of Asya Bibi is reopened, simultaneously, remember all of this happened under the Nawaz Sharif government. The laws relating to the finality of prophethood sallallahu alaihi wasallam those laws are modified so they refer to it uh, these uh, amendments that were made in the law w- were carried out under nawaz sharif and then in 2017 um, you, there were mass protests in pakistan calling for the reforms meaning that the laws should be placed back to their original form. These protests occurred during that same period. In that same period, so the period of 2016, Mumtaz Qadri is hanged. He's killed by the Pakistani government. Nawaz Sharif was Prime Minister at the time and Mumtaz Qadri is killed. There is a blackout, media blackout. He's killed in the morning after 4 a.m. and there is a media blackout. One of the 
hugest funerals in Pakistani history is held despite the media blackout. And then the responsibility of the hanging of Mumtaz Qadri lies, of course, with the judiciary, the, the judge who gave the, the court judgment. Then, in 2017, the mass protests with regard to the case of Asya Bibi occur also, as well as the modification of the Khatmun Nabuwa law, the finality of prophethood. This is all in recent history. And agreements are formed between, supposedly between the Pakistani government and the activists of TLP. In 2018, Asya Bibi is sent out of the country after, after having been found not guilty by the court. So the case was reopened. The case is re-examined and the judgment is given that she was not guilty. How much of this is influenced by foreign powers is plainly obvious, meaning the, how much of the case is influenced and by the foreign pressure that was placed upon Pakistan at that time. At that time, Imran Khan was prime minister. So you have two governor, two, one governor and a minister killed. You have one soldier, uh, a police officer who was protecting Salman Taqsir killed. Three people killed and riots and protests over one Christian woman who is then sent abroad. Even though it is not clear to me what Pakistan was thinking at the time that allowing this woman to, to go abroad, uh, maybe she would speak up against the state once she goes abroad. Allah knows best. But these were some of the aspects uh, of what occurred prior to the republication now recently of the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. So you have Macron praising France for its republication of those uh, of the uh, the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists republishing those cartoons. Now, with regard to the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists. Those attacks occurred in the year 2015. In the year 2015, two brothers killed Charlie Hebdo cartoonists and people in the offices of Charlie Hebdo. Charlie Hebdo, a magazine that drew, uh, depicted or attempted to depict, because of course no one can depict our messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, drew those pictures in order to cause outrage, incendiary cartoons in 2015, they were ki some of those cartoonists were killed. Now when they were killed, what should be the Muslim reaction? This is something uh, I want to mention, a, a very important meaning, what is the legal standing, what is the legal shari'i ruling? What is the legal status of this? The legal status of taking the law into your own hands is, is, is prohibition. That's very clear. So for instance, in this book, a Saiful Jali Ala Thabin Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This book is written by Muhammad Hashim bin Abdul Ghafur a Sindhi. So he's from Sindh, uh, in modern day Pakistan, but this scholar he passed away in the year 1174 Islamic years. So around over uh, 300, well over 300 years ago. This book is a, a reliable book in the Hanafi school. So on page 167, he has the legal status of a few things. I want to make something very clear. That you have people today that when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is insulted, they tell us that we should forgive the insulters. This is hypocrisy. Anyone who says this is a munafiq. Because for two reasons. One is because that is the right of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
when he forgave people in his lifetime, that was his right to forgive. We do not have that right. But secondly, why I would refer to those people as munafiqeen, hypocrites, is because those same people, when they are insulted themselves, or their mother or their father is insulted, they, they take that to heart and they do react. Like the uh, neoliberalists who call for freedom of speech, but their freedom of speech is a limited freedom of speech. Freedom of speech for everyone except those of whom they disagree with. Meaning a, a neoliberal hypocrisy with regard to freedom of speech. So those people who say that we, we should forgive those who insult the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa are munafiqeen, are hypocrites. They are munafiqeen and they should re-evaluate their statements. It contradicts the Sharia. We cannot forgive the cartoonists of Charlie Hebdo. We cannot forgive Salman Rushdie. These are unforgivable crimes against humanity. So the legal status of those who insult the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for instance, he quotes Al-Imam al-Subki, he says, قَالَ أَتَّقِيُّ السُّبْكِيُّ فِي سَيْفِهِ That أَتَّقِيُّ الدِّينَ السُّبْكِ رَحِمَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى أَنَّهُ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَمْ إِنَّمَا عَفَى That the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forgave لِأَنَّهُ صَاحِبُ الْحَقِّ He only forgave because he had the right. Al-Imam Taqiyuddin al-Subki states when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did forgive, he had the right. فَلَهُ الْعَفْوُ وَالْإِنْتِقَامُ Because he had the right of forgiving and punishment. He could have forgiven and punished. وَأَمَّا بَعْدَهُ After the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَلَا يَجُوزُ لَنَا It's not permitted for us and na'fuwa shay'an that we forgive anything. Why why is that? Because anything kana fihi idha un nabiyyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, anything which has an insult or harms the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Charlie Hebdo cartoonists or Salman Rushdie and the like, we do not forgive. We do not have the right to forgive. Likewise, people criticize Alama Khadim Hussein rahimahullah ta'ala of swearing and insulting. Now I say he was a human being and if he did swear and insult, firstly, if he swore and insulted, it depends who he swore and insulted. It also depends because there are certain people who deserve insults, the likes of Macron for instance. He deserves an insult. But additionally, let's say he insulted people wrongly, he was a human being. Inna al-hasanati yudhibna sayyat That the good deeds do away with bad deeds. But why I refer to you as hypocrites is why do you not forgive him for those insults? The way you want us to forgive people for insulting the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa Why is it that you never forgive the clerics who make those mistakes? Why is it that you never have clemency for those clerics that you despise? There were some insolent people who even cursed uh, Alam Khadim Hussein rahimullah, uh, placing curses uh, regarding him may he rot in hell and such type of statements. So those people are hypocrites, munafiqeen, because they despise him for using insults to those who insulted the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yet they have no mercy in their hearts for him. They have no clemency in their hearts for him. So this is the type of neoliberal hypocrisy that we have to deal with day to day. The second point, what I wanted to mention from this book, is that it's not permitted for anyone to take the law into their own hands. So, that is mentioned here, meaning in this book, on page 168 and 169. He mentions that very clear, very clearly, that taking the law into your own hands is impermissible. Now, if someone does, they are liable to punishment from the law. So, if someone does decide to take the law into their own hands, they will face the punishment of the government, that the country that they live in, or wherever they carry out the crime. So they, no one should take the law into their own hands. Additionally, what he mentions, those companions of the Prophet ﷺ who did in, kill those who insulted the Messenger of Allah ﷺ, there is a clear distinction be between those events 
and what occurs today, two distinctions. One is that the, those events where companions killed certain enemies of Islam who insulted the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were approved of by the government of that time, which was the state of Medina in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But additionally, an additional clause is that the companions Ali Muridwan, when they would carry out this act, they did not have underlying motives, meaning they they couldn't they would not abuse the law, making false claims regarding someone. So the law, any law, can be abused. The problem I have with Salman Taqsir is he was only pointing at one particular law, and claiming one particular law is uh, is abused. When this corrupt governor of Punjab and likewise majority of the rulers of Pakistan and governors were corrupt, this corrupt governor of Punjab only pinpoints one law and which is the law which protects the rights of the Prophet ﷺ, refers to that law as a kala qanun, a black law, but does not take up issues with all the other laws or mismanagement or any um, governance. Uh, ordinances of governance in in that country does not take exception to where the other the the state that he was running Punjab, which is one of the most corrupt states in the country, making him the corrupt individual who runs that and governs that state. He only finds one law to pick on, one law. So because of this, Muntaz Qadri took the law into his own hands. He was liable to discretional punishment, but was. Did the government have the right to hang him and kill him? The answer is no. If the government found doubts in the case of Asya Bibi, then there are doubts in the murder of Salman Taqsir. Meaning, if you say Asya Bibi, there were the statements of the witnesses were, because I read the court statements, you're saying the statements are contradicting and therefore the, the witnesses may have been lying. Therefore the had drops. Yes, the had can drop because idra ul hududa bi shubuhat, if there's doubts, then drop the corporal punishments. The had can drop. But why didn't the had drop from Mumtaz Qadri? Based on the fact that Salman Taqsir was dubious in his motives, his statements were dubious, and therefore there is a doubt. The government could have easily placed Mumtaz Qadri in, in solitary confinement, in jail for life, because of doubts and public disorder to keep uh, the uh, meaning keeping the for safety of the public and uh, to avoid uh, public disorder uh, he could have stayed in jail for life but instead they carried out the had punishment for Mumtaz Qadri but this unfair balance in Pakistani society was that the uh, that Asya Bibi was not only acquitted was made to leave the country which from this, their point of view is fine because the case was contradicting and there were problems in the case. Let's say for argument's sake, we accept that. Why was there no shubha in the case of Mumtaz Qadri? The reality is that there was a clash of this polarization that has occurred in Pakistani society, which is the clash of these groups that I have mentioned. In reality, there were shubuhat with regard to Salman Taqsir. Salman Taqsir referring to the law as a black law. There were too many shubuhat for the had to be dropped. I mean, the had should have been dropped on Muntaz Qadri. But the elite of Pakistan needed to demonstrate to the populace of Pakistan that this is what happens when you kill one of us. When you kill one of the elite, this is what will happen to you. We will hang you. And that is, they demonstrated that by carrying out the hanging. Additionally, it proves that Alama Khadim Rizwi rahimallahu ta'ala was not a violent fundamentalist as his detractors state. Why? He has clear statements that he does not believe in revolution. He does not believe in taking up arms against the government. If Khadim Hussein Rizwi was a violent fundamentalist, this was the opportunity for him. Meaning, at that time, if you just look at the crowds that... Uh, turned up at the funeral of Mumtaz Qadri without announcement on public television, he could have called for violent insurrection against the Pakistani civilian government, against Nawaz Sharif. 
yet he did not. And this is what brings us to the current situation, which is when the cartoons were drawn uh, uh, in 2015, they were drawn and published. The cartoonists were killed. What should our position be? Our position is simple. We do not call for violence or we do not call for people to take the law into their own hands. But if someone goes and kills Salman Rushdie, we stay silent. We stay silent. We do not need to have sympathy for those people. This is where the, the line is drawn. Yet you had in Birmingham, in Birmingham and uh, other places, when the, the cartoonists were killed, there were people who had sympathy for the cartoonists. They had sympathy, sympathy for the cartoonists. That is akin to if Salman Rushdie is killed by a lone wolf, we will say that the Islamic law states that a person should not take the law into their own hands because they are endangering themselves. No one should take the law into their own hands. Why? You are endangering yourself. But there is no sympathy for the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists. Then when the cartoons were republished, when the cartoons were republished recently, and the protests were carried out in Faizabad, what is not mentioned, on multiple occasions, Khadim Hussein Rizwi, who was paralyzed in an accident in around 2009. I had met him once in Damascus in 2005 when he came for a visit. Khadim Hussein Rizwi, a paralyzed man, on multiple occasions, was dragged off his wheelchair, beaten with slippers by the Pakistani police officers, yet the neoliberalists criticize him for using harsh language for specific individuals. But there is no condemnation. This is the hypocrisy of neoliberalism. The hypocrisy is that there is only human uh, rights abuses for those who stand for neoliberal philosophies. There, are only, there is only freedom of speech for those who speak for neoliberal ideals. There is only freedom of speech for those people. So, Khadim Hussein Rizvi is a man who has been dragged off his wheelchair, beaten, sworn at. Multiple people of his political party have been imprisoned, beaten, without charge released. Some of them died in prison. And after all of this is done, he holds a protest in Faizabad in recent weeks where he demands from Pakistan to take action with regard to France, with regard to Macron, take firm, resolute action regarding Macron and France. This is, these are his demands. So when he makes these demands, it is claimed that a deal was made and a, bo a boycott of French goods uh, was called for, I think, on 17th of November by Pakistan. But additional steps that need to be taken is the removal of the French ambassador, the closing down of the French embassy and cutting ties with the French. Because if we do not have Pakistan united on the personality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam, the Dastur, the, the constitution, on La ilaha illallah, Sayyiduna Muhammadur Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the country will continue to fragment. The fabric of the society of Pakistan will break up. And this was stated by Al Alama Saeed Ahmad Qadhimi, Rahimallah Ta'ala, who warned Pakistan in the late 60s that if the parliament does not establish the five daily prayers, the country will split. Eventually, in 1971, you had the split of East Pakistan becoming Bangladesh and West Pakistan, today known as Pakistan. This was a split of the country because Islam is what unites Pakistan, not our languages and dialects. Because if we looked at dialects and languages, Pakistan is not a unified entity. If we look at the states, the cultural differences from state to state, 
That is not a unifying factor. The unifying factor of Pakistan is Islam, the identity of Islam, the normative Islam, the Islamic aspects which are agreed upon by all sects. Meaning if someone says which Islam, there are various interpretations. Yes, there are various interpretations, but normative Islam, that which is adopted by all. And the five daily prayers being established in the parliament, which they were not in the early period, was one of the main causes, spiritual causes and spiritual elements of early Pakistan. So today the unification of Pakistan can only occur under Islam. That the unif unifying of Pakistan is only through Islam. So the Khadim Hussein Rizwi, rahimullah, after this protest in Faizabad, he passes away. And his funeral was one of the largest uh, in the history of that country and one of the largest in the history of humanity. But of course, some people say that there is nothing amazing about large funerals, uh, but it does show the sentiments of a large segment of the, the Pakistani population that if ignored, if the sentiments of those people are ignored, it leads marginal, marginalizing those people leads to radicalizing people. So the elite of Pakistan have marginalized a huge segment of the Pakistani population, not giving them a voice, which what they interpret, interpret as radicalization has led to um, an amplification of what is referred to as a radicalization of, of that segment of the Pakistani population. So what steps should be taken now? A unification of Pakistan on the the broader principles of Islam. And uh, wh what I mentioned uh, with regard to a large funeral, someone said that there are false people who have large funerals also. The, the response to that is very simple. The response is that it is not only the size of the funeral, it is the attendees of the funeral. Meaning people who attended that funeral attended for the love of the Prophet wasallam. This is the underlying motive, the unifying cause, that this, that if a, a two billion people attended the funeral of a man simply because uh, they believed that man to be God or, to, or a false belief, it is nothing remarkable. But if 200 people united to pray the funeral of a person for a true cause, then it is something remarkable. The funeral was amazing because of the cause. What was the cause? The cause was standing up for the preservation of the law relating to those who insult the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the law relating to the finality of prophethood. And these are the uni uni uh, unifying aspects that, uh, that unite Pakistan and will continue to unite Pakistan if Pakistanis go back to their religion and the teachings of the religion of Islam. So additional actions is that the French embassy should be closed in Pakistan, strong, uh, because pa France itself revoked 180 visas of Pakistan. So in October, when Prime Minister Imran Khan made those statements against Macron, Macron revoked 180 visas of Pakistani citizens. Then Pakistan, as far as I remember, on 17th of November, called for a boycott of French goods. But now strong action needs to be taken. Those protests in Faisabad were, for not, for, uh, were not for uh, nothing at all. They were for uh, strong reasons. And the strong action that should be taken is that the embassy should be closed and the ties with the France should be cut. This is an issue of Ghayra. Ghayra is uh, 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 a protection of that which is the most dear to an individual, individual, the most dear thing to a Muslim is his messenger, the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. For a Muslim, the sanctity of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is more important than our, than our own sanctity, than our lives, and this is something non-Muslims must understand. That if you kill a Muslim, it's less to a Muslim than an insult to the Messenger of Allah because 
the sanctity of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam is an ideal that we are willing to die for. Fine, uh, closing remarks on this subject are uh, that in our response to these type of cartoons, provocation that occurs from time to time, what type of reaction should we undertake? If we are not permitted to take up arms, meaning as civilians, citizens, we are not permitted to take the law into, into our own hands, how do we respond to insult? Firstly, we should respond. Uh, when it comes to mockery, we should make a mockery of them. Macron should be made, uh, the narcissist. There should be a mockery of Macron. His wife, his relationships with his wife, we should make a mockery of that. So when words are given, words are spoken against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we should match that with words. When cartoons and caricatures are made of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we should employ our artists to make caricatures of what is dear to them, what they hold dear. So Muslims, we should be cerebral in our response to France, to uh, writers like Salman Rushdie, that when they make a, a, a verbal statement regarding the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we should make a verbal statement back. Like the Pakistani minister who tweeted that uh, France is treating French Muslims like uh, the Jews were treated in, uh, in Germany during uh, the Holocaust, I mean the children. The way Muslim children are being treated is like Jewish treat children were treated in Germany. This hurt the feelings of the French that they gave statements regarding their strong sentiments against this statement. But it's a simple statement. A statement against a statement. The word strong statements against those who insult the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is why Khadim Hussain Rizwi was not wrong if he insulted those who insulted the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He never took up arms. He never called for violence. He never took, vi he took up arms himself. He never, uh, even in fact, he, he denied that the people who were destroying public property even belonged to his group. He said, if they do, then bring them forward and have them convicted for damage to public property. Those statements are never mentioned by the liberalists. But nevertheless, the point being that when they make verbal statements against the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we should say strong statements and exercise our freedom of speech. When they make caricatures, make caricatures of them. All of you who are artists, it's halal in this case to draw pictures of Macron and make a mockery of Macron and his wife and his family and everything that is dear to him. Likewise with the Rushdi. So exercise your freedom of speech, freedom to draw and freedom to write. But we do not call for violence. We cannot take up arms. Our religion prohibits taking up arms for the civilian. The governments can. President Erdogan, he can take up arms. Prime Minister Imran Khan and the chief of army staff of Pakistani army. May Allah give them victory over India and Israel. At all times, make dua for Kashmir. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enable Pakistan's army to conquer Kashmir and protect the borders of Pakistan. But the unity of Pakistan is only through Islam. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on Alama Khadim Hussein Rizwi rahimallahu ta'ala. This is first. Secondly, with Macron, if he, if he is ahal to be guided, may Allah guide him. Firstly, if Allah does not want to guide him, then may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do with him what Allah wills. And thirdly, those who are the leaders of the Muslims who intend good with Islam and the Muslims and humanity in general, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen them and give them strength and enable them to do that which is right. Uh, Al-Imam 
Al Hassan al Basri rahimahullah ta'ala was asked, if you had one dua, what dua would you make that? He said, I will make it for the ruler, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectified the ruler so everyone else is rectified. One dua, the dua for the ruler. This does not mean appeasing the ruler when he is doing wrong. It means praying for him that may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make him firm on Islam. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to act upon what is said and to enable us to understand uh, our current situations.